What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Off the Bench. Brandon Carney alongside Maddie Kroll. We are one day later than we normally are. And uh, look, we're going to say that that's due to a planned delay because of this being the tag date and definitely not because I had food poisoning yesterday. Definitely sure. ahead because we're smart and we look ahead like that. Let's get right into it. Today was a big day. Franchise tag deadline. We had some of these going right down to the wire, most notably Daniel Jones and Lamar Jackson. And Daniel Jones got his deal done. We'll talk about him in a second. But Lamar Jackson did not get a deal done and did get that franchise tag non-exclusive placed on him. So he will, if he plays out the season with the Ravens, make about $32 million or a team can sign him to a contract and the Ravens will have an opportunity to match that. Mm -hmm. Keep him or trade him, whatever it is. Maddie, what do you make of how this all played out? We have a not remotely an end to the Lamar saga, but at least a step toward a resolution. What do you make of this and what do you see in the future? I think that there's a strong possibility for a trade here, right? And that the non exclusive basically means like, hey, this makes sense for us, but if somebody's willing to give us a couple of first round picks, have at him. Yeah, I, what I was surprised at was the teams that are already reportedly out of the running, and it, it makes you wonder, right? Like, because a lot of people brought up the Falcons. Uh, Lamar's been linked to them a lot, and then Diana Rossini comes out and reports the Falcons have no interest in pursuing Lamar Jackson. Apparently, same with the Dolphins. The Dolphins are not expected to pursue Lamar, which from an outside perspective, they have Tua, they have a solid quarterback. That's not a surprise. But with how much Lamar has talked up and been linked to just the city of Miami, it's maybe a surprise that Miami is immediately – reported as not a not interested you've got other teams like carolina reported as not interested it's very strange to me how this is all playing out with lamar because this is what we all believe is a very high value quarterback one of when he's at his best a top five at the very least top 10 quarterback and you've got all these teams that are apparently already saying we're out and i don't understand it is are the contract demands just way too much or what's going on here because it, it's very strange to me I really think it's either one of two things. It's either exactly what you said. The contract demands are outrageous and nobody wants to deal with them. Or it's option B and that people are coming out and they're saying, hey, we're not interested. And really on the low, they're trying to slide in and make a, a good offer on him. Because Lamar Jackson's going to, if he gets traded, he's going for a lot. And you obviously want to pay as little as possible. I I don't know. I can't see him being at the Dolphins. I It kind of makes sense just because I feel like maybe they think Tua is their guy unless there's more to that concussion injury that we know about. But outside of that, I think that it really comes down to either people are trying to get the best deal for Lamar or people just don't want to deal with the persona he's putting out. Yeah, and so here's a list of teams per Field Yates that are reportedly not pursuing a deal for Lamar. The Falcons, the Dolphins, the Panthers, and then the Commanders and the Raiders. Why? Four of those five teams desperately need a quarterback right now. And yeah, they have some young guys that they can, you know, take a look at. Like the commanders will take a look at Sam Howell. The Raiders, I, I guess, could take a look at Jared Stidham. I mean, the Falcons have Desmond Ritter, sure. But I don't understand why these teams are right away apparently taking themselves out of the running. It makes me feel like, and, and this is probably the case with, with any major NFL story or rumors. It makes me feel like there's something at play here that we don't know about. I don't mm -hmm. know if the Lamar injury that he's dealing with was more scary than, than people think it is, or if the it really is just the contract demands that he's not letting off of and nobody wants to give that so, sort of guaranteed money to any quarterback. Because again, talked about it last show, Deshaun Watson is the only one who's even in that realm of guaranteed money. Mm -hmm. Um I don't know. It's strange to me. I feel like it's trending toward Lamar Jackson ending up on a new team, but I, I just, all the obvious fits were taken out of the running within an hour of this news breaking. I was so, going to say it was almost immediate. The news broke. And then all of a sudden you start seeing these reports of teams pulling. Yeah. And it, it costs nothing for these teams to talk to Lamar either. It's like, why are you taking yourself out of the running so quickly? It's not like any of those teams I just mentioned, other than maybe the dolphins have, in allegiance to a quarterback that they need to make him feel comfortable and be like, no, dude, don't worry. We're not going after Lamar. Th these teams need quarterbacks. Like I don't, mm -hmm. I don't get it. So you want to know what else is interesting to me? I noted this today. There's hasn't really been any players from any other teams that are 
outwardly asking for Lamar to come to their city, to come to their team. Nobody is begging him to come in, which is strange because <laughs> any other position around the league, you see people with these major free agents, like there are these big name players saying, hey, come play with me. Like, I want to be with you, blah, blah, blah. We haven't heard anything about Lamar. Yeah, that's true. And I mean, especially with the some of the stuff you're seeing today of like Brees Hall basically asking Aaron Rodgers to come to the Jets. I mean, look, we yeah. all know Aaron Rodgers is a head case, but at least he's a good player and players are advocating for him to join them. Lamar, you're right. We haven't really seen that. I'm just I'm trying to look up and down these NFL teams and seeing which ones would be fits for Lamar who haven't already taken themselves out of the running. I guess you could say the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are going to need a quarterback. That's one. Um the rest of these teams either have some semblance of a quarterback in place or have already said no. I, I mean, I, do I float the Patriots out here? I don't think that's going to happen. But, you know, if, if the AFC East ends up having Aaron Rodgers and Josh Allen, maybe it's not a bad thing if you try and go get Lamar Jackson instead of having Mac Jones, not to throw the towel in completely I on cannot. Mac. It's just that stiff competition. Can you just – I would love to be in a meeting with Bill Belichick and Lamar Jackson. I would. It would just be fun to be a fly it, on the wall. It would be, I would just Bill love would to see that. Later. Yeah. Well, I would love to see that from an objective outsider football perspective, just because Bill's had his whole career coaching Tom Brady and Mac Jones. And then to flip a complete 180 play style to Lamar Jackson, not to discredit Lamar as a passer, he's an underrated passer and probably will be for the rest of his career just because of how good he is as a runner. People always think of him yeah. that way first, but he's a good passer. But just having a guy who's so mobile compared to what he's had would be hilarious and, and quite the quite the change. Don't see it happening. I'm just, you know, we're trying to put together any sort of fit for a guy who should be a hot commodity and just doesn't seem to be treated like one. So the Lamar saga. Far from over, curious to see what sort of conclusion this reaches and when it's going to happen, probably after the draft, but maybe before, who knows? It's going to be an interesting couple of months. This is kind of our story of the offseason. Last offseason, we had the entire Deshaun Watson saga, basically, that didn't get wrapped up for a while. Now, similar, we got another AFC North connected uh, quarterback here that's going to be the center of a lot of headlines. So Lamar, well, don't know. And, you know, another thing that's interesting that I actually just thought of is a lot of people were surprised about him falling in the draft and the Ravens did take a chance on him. But there was a lot of rumors around that time that it was just he was so hard to get through to. He didn't have any representation, so it was hard to get him on the phone. It was hard to get him in mm -hmm. meetings. So maybe that's what we're finding out is happening now as well. Yeah, it, it's going to be interesting, too, what kind of. Uh, little news and nuggets come out about Lamar because this is when sort of the, you know, if a guy is not being pursued heavily, there's going to be sort of a slander campaign that, that commences in some way, whether like we've seen there all this little, these, these little news nuggets coming out about Russell Wilson because public perception of him went so negative that people were digging and just finding more and more negative. I think mm -hmm. that might be what's in play for Lamar here too. We're going to find out some things, whether true or not uh, linked to Lamar Jackson. So look, it could be a long off season for Lamar and Ravens fans and anybody hoping to get him on their team, but we will see what this, uh, if, and when this resolution comes to pass going to be, Quite the storyline to watch for. Meanwhile, Daniel Jones was another tag candidate, did not end up getting tagged. The Giants managed to get a deal together for Daniel Jones four years, $160 million. So not 40 or sorry, not $45 million a year, but averages <laughs> out, averages out to $40 million a year. And this just seems to be the way quarterback contracts are going. Like I want to sit here and say Daniel Jones is being overpaid. And I, I still in general do believe that. But when you look at him relative to the other quarterbacks being paid, like Derek Carr just got 37 and a half million a year. Geno Smith just got 35 million a year. And I will say, I think Geno's better than Daniel Jones, but regardless, these are all in the same realm of money. This is just mm -hmm. what quarterback contracts are. And Daniel Jones is much younger than Gino, which I'm sure is partially what came into play, him getting more money than he did. Um, same with Derek Carr getting more than Gino. I don't know what that one's all about. But either way, Daniel Jones getting right in line with kind of what quarterback contracts are lately. How do you feel about this deal for the Giants and what this means for them this season and in the coming years? Because it allows them to, in theory, keep Saquon Barkley, although we don't know how he feels about getting franchise tag. He did get tagged, but it's supposedly yeah. uh, not, not the outcome he was hoping for. That's that's what was shocking to me is especially whenever I was at NFL Honors, I sat by Saquon's parents and then 
it, the only reason that I was able to sit in that seat is because Saquon requested to move to sit by his coach. He wanted to be able to sit in front of Brian Dable. And so I was like, damn, they have a really good relationship. I, from what I've seen, I feel like Saquon wants to be there. I think that that's his team. That's his home. He wants to thrive there. Um, so maybe they brought him in and had that conversation. It seems like they have a good relationship. But to be honest, this shocked me. I thought, if anything, they might tag Jones and, you know, do the opposite. But I, I think that Saquon had to be in on it. I think that in 10 years from now, there's going to be some type of documentary on how Athletes First Agency has changed the way the NFL pays these players because I mean Deshaun Watson still Danny Danny Dimes I mean people can say what they want I don't think he really deserves 40 million I think maybe 30 between 35 and 38 might be a little bit more within his range mm -hmm. but I think seriously we're gonna have some type of documentary that comes out about how much this agency has changed the league yeah I think Daniel Jones in terms of this contract and just kind of how backed into a corner the Giants were with both him and Saquon hitting free agency at the same time or hitting the end of their contracts at least um it's just you could say yes you know sign Saquon to a longer term deal and let Daniel Jones go whatever you wanted to do or you know even franchise Saquon if you didn't want to pay Daniel Jones this long term deal you just let him go they didn't have a backup option so it was kind of you have to roll with Daniel Jones because Otherwise, what do you do, right? Like yeah. there's not, there's not an obvious that you just made the playoffs. So if you willingly let Daniel Jones go, who, even though statistically he wasn't a blow you away type of player, he, he worked with the system. He learned Dayball's system very well and executed it and made that team overall effective. Uh, they didn't have another option to turn to. So they would have just kind of been screwed. Like you can't go out and sign a Jimmy G who will work in the right system, but is, used to playing with the best skill position group in the league. And then if you throw him with, you know, yes, Saquon will be there, but Isaiah Hodgins and Daniel Bellinger and whatever else they end up signing this, like that's not going to work. So they had to keep their quarterback who knows that system and can keep them competitive just because their, their other options were limited and it would have been horrible public perception wise if they let him go and then just tank this upcoming season after such a promising season this last year. I, it's so funny that we're talking about Daniel Jones like this. I don't know, I know why. It's just so funny to me. I was sitting there listening to you just trying to like not giggle. Okay. Daniel Jones doesn't good. Daniel Jones doesn't deserve these headlines. He doesn't. No, he's, he does not. He's not that good. But this is just good it's, for him. it's the NFL, right? It's the beauty of the NFL. There's no other league where one singular position is just so much more important and thus higher paid and higher regarded than the rest of them. It's like yeah. you look at you put Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley side by side and say, which one of these guys do you want to keep around and which one do you want to maybe risk losing? Uh, it's usually pretty obvious. Like you're going to want right. to do everything you can to keep Saquon around. But just having a quarterback who's even top 15 can be a challenge to find sometimes and the Giants mm -hmm. have their guy and the guy that works in their system they didn't want to let him go ultimately I think it worked out for them um, they managed to get this deal done see how much it, it hamstrings them cap wise and how many guys they can bring in to it, make Daniel Jones better but for right now they kept Daniel Jones around they kept Saquon Barkley around I think that's a win for New York yeah, it is going to be interesting to see what happens next year because I think they just bought themselves times and time and maybe put themselves in a little bit of a pickle for next year. But we'll see because that price is going to go up on Saquon. Yeah, and look, I make I make jokes about Isaiah Hodgins, but hey, if the Giants can keep poaching these receivers out of nowhere who are actually fairly productive, then I guess they can get away with paying Daniel Jones forty million dollars. That dude came. That's that fair. dude is like a Madden creative player. He came out of absolutely nowhere toward the end of the season and then scored uh -huh. like every game. I remember there was a game he didn't even have like the right picture on his graphic, or maybe it was I think it was John Brown actually scored a touchdown and they used Isaiah Hodgins' picture. Uh, and I was like, what? This guy is just an anomaly. They had his number wrong on a, a fantasy platform. I can't remember which one, but I had to That's go back surprising. and I like triple checked it. It's, I mean, it just, it happens, but yeah. That's not surprising. But yeah, if the Giants can keep just creating these players in a lab to work well around Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley, maybe that maybe paying Danny Dimes' contract won't hurt them too bad. But we've got some other franchise tags that have been passed out around the league. We've got Evan Engram, Tony Pollard, Josh Jacobs, and Deron Payne. So- Evan Ingram. Any surprises? No, I wouldn't say any surprises. I think uh, mostly deserved. It, it is going to be funny to see, you know, Saquon, Tony Pollard, and Josh Jacobs all making the same amount because I feel like those are all 
different levels of running back and they're all going to be making the exact same amount of money. Like to me, Saquon is like a little above Josh Jacobs and Josh Jacobs is just at least more experienced than Tony Pollard is like Pollard still at the, hasn't had that workhorse season yet, which he may have this year if the Cowboys end up getting rid of Zeke, but I would say no, no real surprises here. Yeah. I, I go back and forth. Um, I don't think that there was anything too crazy to be honest with you. The only one that kind of surprised me was Pollard just because I went back and forth on this, but I actually was on a show yesterday, I believe, or maybe Sunday. No, it was Sunday. Um, and the, the only reason I decided to keep Pollard where he was at was because I felt like Jerry Jones understands that they were just trying to appease him with Zeke. When you go back and you watch the film, Pollard – move the ball down the field the entire season. And what they would do is just use Zeke to punch it in. So Pollard actually was very productive. I just don't think that people realize how much of a value and asset he actually was because they were trying to utilize Zeke and make it look like Zeke's still RB1. Yeah, I think there's more than a chance that Tony Pollard looks like he's worth far more than, what is it, $10.9 million this upcoming mm-hmm. season. Like, there's a chance he blows that tag out of the water. Like, I yeah. I really do think that. And this is coming from somebody who was a Zeke apologist for probably two seasons longer than I needed to be. I was like, <laughs> look, they don't need to hand the keys to Tony. Zeke's still got something left. And Zeke does still have something left in, like, a, a fullback capacity. Like, I do believe he has a nose for the end zone. And if you need two yards, there may not be a better back in the league other than Derrick Henry to get you two yards. Or – We can Mm -hmm. count Jalen Hurts and that QB sneak to get you two yards, but not the same thing. Um, So I think Tony Pollard could definitely outperform his tag. But overall, these tags all make sense to me. I mean, it's players that these teams kind of need to stay around to if they want to be competitive. Evan Engram, I think, is a super fascinating story. Just good for him coming off the Giants where he was known for just dropping the ball and and not being what they wanted it to be, which is funny because I believe statistically his drop percentage actually wasn't that much different. It was just that the Jags used him better than New York did. Mm -hmm. Not overly shocking given that Engram never got to play with the day ball version of the New York Giants. If he did, that could have been interesting, but instead he gets to play with uh, Doug Peterson and the Jaguars and now Mm -hmm. beyond one of the up and coming teams in the NFL. So good for Evan Ingram, got that payday and uh, hopefully can get something more long-term here going forward. Can I just say, I hate the franchise tag in general. I think it's just the worst thing. Do you? It's horrific. It's so bad, especially for you look at the running backs, like Saquon, Tony Pollard, Josh Jacobs, the franchise tag was designed to be a give and take where you're getting a lot of money and we don't have to commit to anything long-term. The problem is that's not a lot of money for the running backs. Like those running backs would command more on a longer term contract. So it's just a way, especially for the running back position to like burn another year when their shelf life is already so short. And it's like, Mm -hmm. if any of these backs, especially, I don't know who's the oldest one out of those backs. I want to say it's probably Jacobs, but either way, all around the same. Let's say any of them show a, 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 a step back next season. Then they don't have to get a long term deal and they don't make any like major, major money over the course of their NFL career, at least not to where past running backs have. I understand that a lot of the objective fans listening to this aren't going to, you know, cry any tears over a guy getting $11 million this season. I get that, but we're just speaking in terms of relative value and what these guys deserve compared to what their position group has gotten in the past and should get in the future. I don't know. I just think it's such a, it's such a one, it's become a one-sided thing. I agree, especially for what these guys have to put their bodies through. Running backs really get the brunt of a lot of these hits. Yeah, you can have great players that just never reach their second contract, like their second, a second full contract of what they would deserve in their prime because they're just getting franchise tagged to death. So just just a bummer. I I feel like the franchise tag eventually will get either adjusted or phased out, maybe not anytime soon, but it's uh, it's looking looking a little unfair in my eyes. Um, All right, moving on. I couldn't get over this because this seemed like it was satire. Uh, There was some, you know, plenty of news and rumors come out of the combine. This being, I think, the most notable one, something that was overheard uh, from Matthew Barry, actually. Fantasy guy, works at NBC Sports Mm now. According to Matthew Barry, uh, one person at the combine spoke of Alan Lazard, possibly a person representing the Ravens or the Chiefs, and said, my nipples are hard for Alan Lazard. I'm not surprised. I'm not, not surprised. surprised. You're not surprised. At, no, you're not I'm surprised really not. at the at the wording of this, really. I mean, it rhymes. I, I guess. I okay. <laughs> a 
first of all, this sounds Alan like was, a really bad dad joke is what this sounds it's, like. It's awful. It sounds like someone had a few too many drinks one of those nights after the combine and Probably it was scared. just like, man, my nip. I, this wording being used for a guy who's essentially a blocking receiver and is just very, very mid in terms of actually pushing the ball. Look, Alan Lazard has his place in the NFL. I don't want to diminish him at all, but not exactly the caliber of receiver that should be getting your nipples hard. I wouldn't think. I, but maybe look at the two teams that are saying that. The two the Ravens, teams that yeah. it's narrowed down between. Look, the Ravens make literally all the sense in the world because they refuse I, to get actual pass catchers. They just yeah. want dudes who will do other things but are listed at receiver. So I get yeah. that one. The Chiefs. I feel like that came out of Baltimore. It, it definitely did. The Chiefs yeah. uh, also, I mean, look. You get Alan Lazard in Kansas City, and he's probably going to catch 12 touchdowns because Patrick Mahomes is a lunatic. But I don't know. They literally I, I just... gave a TikTok boy a shot. They yeah, said, exactly. Bring in Juju. We're excited about him. Or, I'm sorry. The Chiefs brought in Juju. They're like, we're excited yeah. about him. So, like, I honestly don't put it past the Chiefs either. Alan Lazard has his role. He should not be getting anyone's nipples hard. Look, if, if someone comes out and says Justin Jefferson gets their nipples hard, I'm not really going to argue with you. I'm not. Uh, Jamar I was just Chase. About to ask. Jamar Chase, I, I, I don't know. CD Lamb, you, these young up and coming or already established good receivers. Alan Lazard, you got you got some problems you got to work out. That's all I'm going to say about that. All right, moving on from this. I feel like Heavy needs statement. to make that a shirt. I want to. Alan oh, Lazard God. makes my nipples hard shirt. Please make that happen. We need to be very careful about the design of that shirt, but that could be a very well selling shirt. I will say that much. All right, moving on here. Uh, some quarterback news that I thought might be our headline, but obviously was surpassed by Lamar and, and Daniel Jones. Derek Carr agrees to a four-year, $150 million deal with the New Orleans Saints, up to $100 million guaranteed. Again, just another statement on where quarterback contracts are in this modern era, this day and age. Maddie, how do you feel about this contract, and how do you feel about the Saints in general now? I I like this contract. The Saints, I think it's definitely elevated them. I'm going to be excited to see what happens with Lamar. I know that there's been rumors that Atlanta's pulled out, but I think that if that's not the case and Lamar moves into that division, it might be a battle to see who's up at the top. If not, I think that the Saints are all the way up there as far as right now. Yeah, I feel like – I mean, as we sit here March 7th, uh, you know, the Saints are definitely the favorite in that division just because they're the only one with an actual quarterback who's competent and has any level of experience in the NFL. I mean, the other quarterbacks in there are Kyle Trask, Desmond Ritter, and actually Matt Corral. I think I incorrectly may have said P.J. Walker or something in a previous episode. But no, those are the quarterbacks who are actually under contract for each of those teams. Yeah, they're definitely the favorite as of right now. I feel like once the offseason plays out, look, I've talked up the Panthers plenty already. I have some faith that the Panthers will figure something out at the quarterback position that will make me ultimately pick them to win the division when we get closer to August. Uh, but for now, it's a good move for the Saints. I, it makes them better. I just don't know what this does for them once those other teams get competent. Because right. this is this is a – what look, signing Derek Carr realistically – is a commitment to mediocrity. It is. It's just that it the is. rest the rest of their division right now is below mediocrity. The rest of their division is bad right now. So mm -hmm. they put themselves in a position to win the division, maybe, um, but it's just not a high upside play. I honestly feel better about it for fantasy football implications than I do about real life implications. Like right. it makes me excited for Chris Olave more than it makes me excited for oh, Saints fans to go and win a ring. Yeah, it's going to be great for Chris Olave. I the way I look at it is there was no way they were going to get a better quarterback this season. There are too mm -hmm. many teams that have a better shot at making it to the postseason, making it to the Super Bowl with a good quarterback that a qu good quarterback is going to go to. So it was either they do this or they do something drastic and try to get a rookie quarterback. Like there were just no other options for them. So for me, this makes sense just to kind of pay him and try to make things work with him um but i i completely see what you're saying in one to two years it's going to be completely different i'm not on the um on the panthers uh high train but i do think that in a couple years in a year even next year it's going to be a completely different story same thing with the bucks the bucks are going to be coming back so i 
I don't know, long term. I don't know that I love it, but it makes sense for right now. Yeah, it, it does make sense. It's just it makes sense in terms of they exist in quarterback purgatory, like so many other teams yeah. in the NFL do. And it's just you have to go with what your best option is. And they they got the best option. I mean, look, there's going to be other teams that could have been in contention for Derek Carr who are now going to be worse off than the Saints are going to be because they have at least a halfway decent, maybe back end of the top 12 13, 14, I don't know, quarterbacks in the NFL, but he's at least top half. Um, so it, it's a good move for them. They'll be better. It's just we'll, we'll have to revisit this in a year or two and see how we're feeling if, if any of these other teams can actually find somebody who's above, you know, just being okay. But again, mm-hmm. draft Chris Alave. He might be my fantasy wide receiver one. We will see. I was going to ask you, if if Kamara doesn't get suspended and he actually We're gets a shot. Doing this again. Yeah. Do you think that this is going to improve his fantasy output? <sighs> No, I feel like Alvin Kamara, any of his deficiencies that he had this past season were mostly on him, not really the lack of the lack of quarterback play, which they definitely had. But look, Derek Carr to me is Andy Dalton plus Andy Dalton, maybe plus plus. We'll, we'll add a, we'll add a couple of degrees saying, there. It's kind of a burn. Right? It, it's, it's a little bit. I look. I don't know. I don't see him as a crazy huge. He's an upgrade over Andy Dalton. Don't get me wrong, but I just don't see him being such a difference that it changes Alvin Kamara's production drastically. I'm kind of just off Alvin Kamara as, as a fantasy asset. If, if you know every player has a value, if he falls to me in a certain round, mm-hmm. then great. But I, I think Alvin Kamara's RB one, uh, you know, top RB one days are, are kind of past. They're him, gone. So I they're gone. I had somebody ask me that question, so I just thought it'd be fun to ask you. I no, that's. That's totally valid. All right. Keep it rolling on the quarterback train here. Geno Smith agrees to a three-year, $105 million deal with the Seattle Seahawks. Let me just say, out of all of the contracts signed by these quarterbacks, this one is my favorite for it both makes the most parties. Sense. It makes the absolute most sense. It's not too long of a contract, and Geno gets to have that generational wealth sort of contract that he earned just through complete hard work, turning his career around. And the timeline is perfect because mm-hmm. he's at an age, you know, we've talked about, it. I, I, how old is Geno Smith? I don't want to get it wrong. I want to say he's 32, 30, or, sorry, 30. 30, 32. So he'll be 35 when the, or yeah, 35 when the contract ends, um, which is going to be right around when, you know, a reasonable fall off non-injury related would happen. Right. Yeah. So it's just perfect timing for I really want the Seahawks to draft Anthony Richardson. I really, really, really do. Wouldn't that be great? I think Honestly. this this lines up perfectly with Geno's contract for that to happen, and it's perfect for Anthony Richardson because that dude desperately needs to go to a place where he's not going to be pressured to start. Like, mm-hmm. forget coaches who will – wherever he goes, coaches can say, no, we don't want to start, whatever. Once your starter starts underperforming week six, week seven, whoever it is – that noise gets too loud and these young guys end up getting pushed into a starting role. I think Gino has proved enough that he would hold off all of that noise for at least a year, if not two. And then look, mm-hmm. we get to the third year of Gino's contract and they want to start Richardson over him. Fine. But even if it takes all three, that's the perfect development spot for him. And I, I just, I would love to see him end up there. 100%. And you're getting him in there with a veteran who knows what it's like to have to sit behind somebody who knows what it's like to have to give your effort and show up every day, even if you're not that starter. So I think 100%, I agree with that. Right. So Geno Smith deal, congrats to him. Uh, good deal for him. Good deal for the Seahawks. And I think we'll make the Seahawks contenders in the NFC West. I mean, look, the Niners are kind of a, a wagon. They don't seem to care who their quarterback is. They're going to be at the top of the division regardless. But we were talking about this toward the end of the season. Until the Seahawks had a little bit of a, a stumble, I mean, they were right there fighting for that division crown. I, things break a certain way. Certain injuries may happen to the Niners. It's not like they've been uh, you know, opposed to those over the years. Those have happened to them plenty. Uh, the Seahawks, it's not out of the question that during the course of Geno's contract, they can win the NFC West over the 49ers. Could happen as soon as this year. You never know. So great deal for Geno. Great deal for the Seahawks. Moving on to the Jaguars. So we already talked about Evan Engram getting the franchise tag. Calvin Ridley, though, reinstated to the NFL, a move that I think most of us expected to happen. Yeah. Uh, but this trade kind of caught everybody by surprise at, at the trade deadline because this dude was out of all of our thoughts and we, nobody was thinking about Calvin Ridley at the time. And the Jags said, you know what? We'll trade for him because why not? So now the Jaguars have 
a very formidable offense going into next year. I mean, you've got yeah. Trevor Lawrence, who looks to have taken a leap, thanks to Doug Peterson. You've got Travis Etienne, who came on at the end of last year as well, after they traded James Robinson. Then you've got a receiving core now of Calvin Ridley, Christian Kirk, and Zay Jones, and the franchise tag tight end Evan Engram. Ingram. This team is going to win that division, and I don't – is it going to be close? Like it's not. It's not going to be close at all. No, no they are now a force to be reckoned with. Within one year, they made a complete one hundred and eighty. Yeah, I mean, I the guess only technically two years. The only team you can even think of that would be a possibility is the Colts if they can find a quarterback, and that's asking a lot because uh, they bungled that so many times. I mean, yeah. they're at least seeming like they're going to go after one in the draft rather than some aging veteran whatever Derek Carr is already off the market thank god so the titans uh again we've talked about don't look to be trending the right way and the texans is just going to be it's going to take longer than one year for them to figure it out so yeah i think the jaguars are looking like not only heavy favorites for this division but i mean potentially winning the afc like this is this is a team that's entering that conversation quickly because quickly so many of these teams are out of that sort of discussion of, of winning their conference because they don't have the elite level quarterback. It's one of my concerns with the Saints. Like, I don't see any way that this iteration of the Saints with Derek Carr like makes a conference title game. But yeah. Trevor Lawrence is about to enter that elite tier of quarterbacks if he hasn't already. So it would not surprise me in the least to see the Jags in a Super Bowl as early as next year. Wow, you think as early as next year? I, I'm not saying I'm going to pick it, but like if you were to tell me the Jags made the Super Bowl next year, no, I'd absolutely not be surprised. Be they they won a playoff game this year by making a 30 point comeback on a solid team. Like, yes, it's the Chargers mm -hmm. and they do that stuff all the time, choking, but the Jaguars still had to do their part. Trevor Lawrence not rattled by throwing four interceptions in a single half because that's just the culture that the Jags have built. They supported him the whole way. Now they have another offseason to gel with guys they already have, add a receiver who may be a top 10 talent at the position. Like, as long as Calvin Ridley can knock the rust off. Out hungry. Yeah. Yeah. He, He's going to be pissed. Like he doesn't want this to be his reputation. The dude who was about to maybe ascend to that next level at wide receiver and then had to get, you know, sat down because he gambled. Like he's hopefully going to be motivated and just the rest of that team is going to be super, super motivated. I think there's a chip on everybody's shoulders, including Doug Peterson after getting let go by the Eagles, Trevor Lawrence, who just hasn't accomplished anything major at this level yet. The only level where he can say that because he's been such right. a winner his whole life. So now I think big things for the Jags and Calvin Ridley is going to be a big part of it. Yeah, so you guys heard it here in March of 2023. The Jags are making the playoffs. Jags are winning the Super Bowl here. If you wow. can come back to March and and pick this one out, whether I'm right or wrong, good for you. I, I, that's <laughs> that's a good that's a good memory on you guys if you get there because that's uh, what 11 months from now. Yeah, good I luck. I can't remember what we talked about last week. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Neither can I. Um, one more little franchise tag note that kind of went by the wayside because he didn't get tagged. So. Chiefs will not tag Orlando Brown Jr., and they are also expected to release Frank Clark. Maddie, I know you had some fairly strong thoughts on Orlando Brown Jr. over the course of the postseason. How do you feel about the Chiefs deciding not to tag him when it seemed like it was expected that they would franchise tag him for a second time? I think it's smart. I think that if you go back and actually watch the Chiefs film, one, he didn't get called for half of the holdings that he actually had. He progressively got lazier as the season went on. And I feel bad saying this because boomer sooner and I want to be able to support him. <laughs> but the dude's not a left tackle. I mean, I know that his dad was great and I know that he wanted to be what his dad was, but his the way his body is set up, the way he reacts, he is more of a right tackle than being on the left side. I think that he used he leans too much on that lean. And I think that he's going to have a really hard time finding any team in the league that's going to pay him what he wants. Yeah, I, I wasn't I was I was a little surprised by it. But at the end of the day, the Chiefs know what they're doing. I've decided to just trust them at this point. I'm not going to question really any moves that they make for financial or personnel reasoning. Um, but, you know, it just means more turnover in Kansas City, maybe some turnover that people weren't expecting. And we will just have to see. I think people are past the point of doubting them, though, when they have that turnover. If, if they didn't fall off when they, you know, traded Travis Kelsey, uh, or sorry, not Travis Kelsey, I traded like, Tyree wait, Kill. <laughs> they traded Travis Kelsey. Yeah, you didn't know. Uh, no, if they didn't fall off after trading Tyree Kill to the Dolphins and turning Mahomes' receivers into just a gaggle of whom, whomever. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think this is really going to change much either. So we'll see what cool. the Chiefs have in store to, uh, you know, fill out those those spots, though. And they completely rebuilt their offensive line in basically a year. Everybody said it couldn't be done, and there they went. So yeah. good for them. Absolutely. Uh, sticking in the AFC, we kind of talked a second ago about the Titans and just their prospects in the AFC South. So we've got some conflicting reports here. Uh, report that 
the Titans may be looking to trade Derrick Henry. And then another report from CBS Sports, Jonathan Jones, that says they're not shopping Henry. To me, where there's smoke, there's fire. Whether they're actively shopping Derrick Henry, I don't know. Probably not. They're probably not calling these teams begging to take him. But I feel like where the Titans are at this point, they might be willing to trade him if the right offer comes to them. So how do you feel about Derrick Henry possibly being traded? And does it make sense for the Titans at this point in time? I mean, if the Titans are looking to blow it up, yeah, go ahead. But I just nothing points to this making sense outside of that. Like, unless they are just going to go in and just say, this is the year that we're just going to blow it all up and see if we can't rebuild next year, maybe get some some picks out of him. That makes sense. But it just doesn't make sense for me outside of that. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, you're not trading Derrick Henry if you're trying to still contend. Um, right. To me, it it made a little sense because of what you just said. Like they may be looking to finally, not finally, it's not like it's been a long time coming. They may be looking to blow it up just because of the season they just had um, and thinking that they need a fresh start. I mean, Derrick Henry's a guy who's already passed, well past the age apex of where running backs usually fall off, but we've all just kind of had to accept that he is quite literally built different. And so we don't know how long it's going to be until he actually falls off from a production Mm -hmm. standpoint. Uh, But they may be trying to get ahead of it and get some value out of him because if they're like, they don't think they can compete for a Super Bowl this upcoming season, like we never know. This could be Derrick Henry's last really productive season, or this could be the season that he starts to fall off and they can't get anything for him next season, you know, after Mm -hmm. they – realize that they need to go full rebuild. So I wouldn't be shocked. I'd be a little surprised if they traded him within the AFC. And it seems like that's where some of the early, early rumors have been. People are like, oh, the Bills need a running back. And let me just say, putting Derrick Henry and Josh Allen on in the same backfield, I no, please don't do that. That will just hurt too many people. Uh, but no, I, I feel like it wouldn't be in the AFC. But I do, I, I could see it. I, I don't know that I expect it, but I could see it. So Derrick Henry joins uh, DeAndre Hopkins and Jalen Ramsey on the trade block, at least, you know, the theoretical trade block. We will see if any of these guys actually end up moving. I feel like Jalen Ramsey probably will. DeAndre Hopkins also probably will. Uh, reportedly, the Cardinals are looking for a second rounder and then another pick or a player to go along with that. To me, most teams should be paying that for DeAndre Hopkins if you need a receiver at all. I mean, a second round, they're not asking for a first second round pick. And then another smaller asset seems like a no brainer Patriots. No brainer. Please, please, please. Um, Plenty of teams that would be begging for that. Let's be honest. Look look, at this point, our, our listeners are going to be like, huh, if this guy ran the Patriots, they'd have Lamar Jackson throwing to Deandre Hopkins in in New England, (laughs) you know, all season long. I'm like, yep. Look, being a GM is not that hard. Just make it happen. It's not, you don't need draft picks. Yeah. We don't need draft picks. What what are those? Those turn into players who are younger. I don't care. Give me a Super Bowl. Give me Lamar throwing a D hop, and then we'll throw to uh, Slade Bolden, who apparently the Patriots have been looking at too because Mac Jones likes him. But whatever. Look, that offense be elite. I'm all for it. Um, we talked about the combine last week as we were heading into it. Watch a little bit of it. Um, overall, I, I think we talked about this too. The combine's a little bit overrated in terms of just people overreacting to things. But Maddie, was there anything that stood out to you about the combine? Did you enjoy any certain event or player or, or anything from it? Um, I, I have to admit, I was not expecting Anthony Richardson to like do his his big thing. Um, mm. I'm going to butcher this name. You guys bear with me. Uh, TCU guard. I know who you're going for, and I don't know Avi- how to say it either. Avila, his first name's Steve. I can do Steve. We're going to okay. go with Steve. Um, he is so fluid, and watching him and his movements, he's going to easily transition well into the league, um, especially if he's at a guard position. Hopefully they keep him there. He's one that people need to watch because I know a lot of people don't pay attention to the offensive line, but he's going to be a force to be reckoned with as long as he progresses along this way. I was very impressed with him. Absolutely. The one one guy that caught my eye, uh, I don't know if I was just watching at the right time, but I'm seeing other people kind of, you know, they were just as impressed by him. Nolan Smith, uh, outside mm-hmm. linebacker, Georgia. He just, first of all, his interview was awesome. I love guys. That's great. I love guys that are like so comfortable talking to interviewers and actually are able to show their personality in those moments. Cause some guys understandably are going to, you know, shy away from it and just not be comfortable, but the ones that do, it's so nice to be able to get to know those players a little bit. Uh, but Nolan Smith absolutely blew the combine out of the water, ran a four, three, nine 40, 
41 and a half inch vertical and 10 foot eight broad jump. And uh, here's a note here at 238 pounds. He's now the second heaviest player ever to run a sub 4.4 40 and have a 40 plus inch vertical jump at the combine since 2006. Vernon Davis is the other. So physical freak. Um, yeah. Just super impressed by him. There were reports that there were scouts that were hiding their watches because they thought that they timed him wrong. No way. That's insane. That's awesome. Absolutely that is, insane. That's fantastic. So I had to just give some props to him and some props to Stetson Bennett, another guy who yes. I'm just I'm just kind of starting to plant my flag in this dude because I'm over the last few weeks and basically since the national championship game, I have been just wondering why. There's not, I'm not asking for a ton of hype on Stetson Bennett. I know he's older. I know he doesn't have a great frame. I understand his arm strength isn't anything great, but like, this is a guy that I could see starting in the NFL and being like productive. Like, I don't think he's going to ascend to being a star, but he put on a good combine now. And on top of being so successful at the college level, I don't know. I, I just, I see him having a very long career in the NFL, whether it's as a starter or a backup, I just don't see him going away. I think all the people dismissing him because he's 26 and because he's, you know, a smaller in stature guy, I think it's silly. Like this is a guy that mm-hmm. you go out and get him in the fourth round or so. I think you're going to be happy with him if you need a quarterback, or at least if you need a quality backup at some point. So I just want to give Stetson Bennett a little bit of love. I think he's uh kind of underrated. And if he was, you know, 23, we might be talking about a couple rounds higher for him. So Mm -hmm. we'll see where he ends up in the draft. And again, with this Lamar drama, the Ravens hired Georgia OC Todd Monken. We'll see. Maybe he, maybe Stetson ends up there. We brought that up a couple episodes ago. Could be getting closer to happening. Who knows? All right. Moving on to a segment that Maddie broached to me a couple days ago, and I was moderately concerned about the subject. (laughs) But look, I'm all in and now I'm ready. We've got Would You Rather. This was solely to be able to get your followers to troll you. This is this is where we're going. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. So question number one. Would you rather go through a darkness retreat with Aaron Rodgers or Antonio Brown? All right. Do I value my physical health or my mental health is what this really comes down to. There is no chance that Antonio Brown doesn't try and break something while we're in a darkness retreat, whether it's it me you. or break his way out. I, either way, I don't think he's built for that. Aaron Rodgers has this creepy, weird persona that he's just like super Zen. So I think he, he would at least fake it and be fine. Like being totally Zen and calm for however long it is. The thing is he would just talk my ear off and drive me goddamn insane. So <laughs> I'm going to pick Aaron Rodgers. I just want to say the fact that you've put me in this position makes me very upset. I don't want to do this. Just wait till the next one. Fantastic. It gets worse. Awesome. Okay. Great. Would you rather number two draft Kyle Pitts in the first round for the rest of his career or draft a kicker in the first round for one season? Give me the kicker. Give me the kicker. I, that's not even a question to me. Kyle Pitts. Look, even if Kyle Pitts becomes God, even if Kyle Pitts becomes Travis Kelsey, at a certain point, that's not going to be worth it. Like, once he's older, it's not going to be worth it. And that's also a gigantic if of if he becomes Travis Kelsey. I'm assuming Kyle Pitts is going to end up being like a back end of the top five tight ends at some point if all things work out for him. But that is not worth... uh, that's not worth the first round pick ever. So get, I'll throw it. I'll, I'll take the kick. Look, my first round picks have busted in fantasy before. I'll take the kicker. I'll take Justin Tucker and be happy with him all season long. Yes, it'll suck it to not have a legitimate first round pick. It might be the only points they score if they get rid of Lamar. Exactly. I mean, he's just going to be bombing 80-yard field goals. So, no, I'll take the kicker. Absolutely. I can't deal with Kyle Pitts, especially if he doesn't pan out. God, I want to just die every season for the next 15 seasons. That's rough. Okay. Next question. We are going to, okay, would you rather watch your rival win five Super Bowls in the next decade or never watch football again? Oh, I got to take the rival. I can't, I can't not watch football. I mean, first of all, who's our rival? I mean, are we going Jets or Giants or Bill? I guess it's probably the Jets. Um, I'm just so not used to seeing the Jets have any level of success that it it feels weird to consider them a rival. Uh, But yeah, I get, man, the Jets winning five straight Super Bowls would be tough. But I can't not have football. I'll suffer the five years, I guess. I'll suffer the five years. That's fair. Pain. All There's right. Pain. Okay, let's go to the next question. 
I'm not sure which one's popping up next, so I want to make sure. Okay. Oh, this is funny. Would you rather be forced to listen to 24 straight hours of Stephen A. Smith talking about Zach Wilson or Skip Bayless talking about Baker Mayfield? Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to need your help here because I don't subject myself to these two super often. So I'm guessing Stephen A.'s opinion on Zach Wilson is that he's awful and he just rants against him all the time. Correct. It's really both of these people just ran. Steven's just a lot more of a yeller. I would but they say. they both dislike these players, right? They yes. don't have like any sort of allegiance toward them. Okay. Pretty much, yeah. I'll take Stephen A. Smith talking about Zach Wilson because I also hate Zach Wilson. I actually like Baker Mayfield. I root for him. I mean, I don't know what he's going to become. He had a nice little end of the season run with the Rams. I hope he gets a job somewhere and, and bounces back. But I can't listen to Baker Mayfield slander for that long. I actually like the dude. Zach Wilson, look, I, I could have a cup of coffee with Stephen A. and we could shit talk Zach Wilson together if he wanted to because that that's that's what like half my videos were last season. So I could definitely do that. All right. I think we have one more. It's pulling up. I don't know if it's in there, but this is the one that I wanted to get to. Okay. Would you rather Matt Patricia become the Patriots head coach or have to declare yourself a Colts fan forever? Okay. My it's unfortunately it's an easy answer. I'm too loyal to my teams. I could never go away from the Patriots no matter what. Uh, Here's the thing about Matt Patricia becoming the Patriots head coach. It would last all of one season. So, and I know that I know that for a fact. So that's okay. Especially if it somehow happened after this past season, if they decided to fully go the other, I don't even think he'd make it to the beginning of the season. There'd be such riots (laughs) in the streets of, of Gillette and Foxborough and Boston. It would be terrible. It'd be awful. So I guess if we're logically trying to say how he could become head coach, let's say it happened before this past season, Bill retired and was like, Matt, Patricia, you're the head coach now. Yeah, we'd suffer through one horrific season, maybe two, and then he'd be gone. Being a Colts fan for the rest of my life, not only am I a traitor, I'm a fan of a franchise that has been not historically unsuccessful, but unsuccessful lately, and just, no, I I can't go away. I have these teams that are so locked into my personality that there's just no way. I'd suffer with Patricia for a bit, I guess, but screw that guy. Hopefully we don't manifest that. All right. I'm done torturing you. You oh, survived. You're out thank of a God. hot seat. Uh, I feel like I just walked over hot coals with bare feet with Legos mixed in. That was pain. All right. Finishing up with our viewer questions as we usually do. I like this one off the bat. So we sa- he said, are there any true just a quarterback away teams? The Broncos made it seem like it's not that easy. Question coming from Patrick Lowe. I think there absolutely is such thing as a quarterback away. So we saw the Rams win a Super Bowl. All they need to do is get Matthew Stafford, right? I think we're looking in the present right now, if there's any team that's just a quarterback away, it's the New York Jets. If they can find, if they can get Aaron Rodgers and Aaron Rodgers is still truly, or at least close to being in his prime and puts together another vintage season, I think the Jets can compete for a Super Bowl. There's absolutely a thing about being just a QB away. The thing that's not that easy is getting that quarterback. Like mm-hmm. the Broncos, they are, they, they are, I think still just a quarterback away from at least being like relative contenders, but they went out and got damaged goods who didn't perform well in their system. So yes, it's absolutely a thing. Um, it was just also the fact that the Broncos got a coach that wasn't equipped for the job either. So right. there's certain things that are uh, at play. I think the Broncos may have been just a QB away and also just a head coach away. And they just kind of botched both of those they things, but it's it still, it still applies in, in other situations. Agreed. Um, then we've got, should the NFL partner with the XFL as a minor league system, similar to the MLB, this question coming from Brennan Visco. So I wanted to answer this question just to clarify what exactly the XFL is to the NFL right now. So they are partnered in a way, um, they have agreements in place to, you know, test out certain rule changes and stuff like that. But also in terms of the player contracts, any XFL player is allowed to attend NFL camps after the XFL season is over. So they are trying to use it as a feeder system to the NFL overall. I don't think it will ever turn into a system with the MLB where there's you know 32 teams that are minor league teams in the XFL, not just because logistically you can't have that many teams. We probably wouldn't have enough players to make it worth it. But the reason there's no minor league system for the NFL is because these teams, if they have players that they're – interested in developing or keeping on the back burner in case they need them. They don't necessarily want them taking full speed reps all the time. And that's why practice squads exist is because they can get certain types of reps, but it's not, they don't want them in full speed tackle games all the time, week to week. Like, especially if you, 
you know, MLB, you've got actually high level prospects who will play in the minors for a long time. You draft a guy in the NFL who you feel is not ready. Like take uh, the chiefs and sky Moore. sky Moore looked a little out of his depth at times this year. If you yeah. took him and put him on an XFL minor league team and God forbid season ending injury, that's end of minor league teams right there. Like that's, it's right. not happening. So I don't think it will ever be exactly like the MLB, but there is a relationship already just in case anybody out there didn't know that like the XFL and NFL are very much working together, which I think is awesome for the league. Mm -hmm. And I do think that a lot of the, um, a lot of the NFL teams that are looking to draft younger guys that are coming out are starting to take on a little bit of Alabama Clemson. They're taking on these players that they've kept an eye on. They are trying to integrate a little bit of their playbook into the NFL schemes. So it's almost like they're using the college level to feed up as well in that right. sense of trying to prepare them. So I agree with you there. I don't think that XFL will turn into a minor league situation. Exactly. But interesting question. Nonetheless, happy to shed some light on how exactly those two leagues are working together. And then finally, another sport that we are dipping into. And look, actually, I'll give you guys a quick preview. Next week, I plan to do a decent little March Madness preview since it'll be after Selection Sunday. We will dive mm -hmm. directly into that. But for now, one team to win it all in March Madness. I mean, what else am I going to say here? What what else am I going to possibly say here? You see the shirt I'm wearing. We had uh, we had somebody at heavy challenge me to wear a different Yukon shirt for the duration of, you know, the end of March madness. God, I got to go with Yukon. I have to, I have no choice. This is a team got up to number two in the country at one point early this season, had some tough sledding in the middle of the year. Once conference play conference play started and is seeming to find their groove again here at the exact right time. So we'll see how they perform in the big East tournament, which I will actually be at. I'm going with UConn. I think they have everything it takes to win a national championship, and I think it's finally time to get back there after just the dark times that we suffered, basically for my entire college experience there. That was a blast. Honestly, this is going to be incredible. I can't wait to see the footage of you being there. Um, I think that if I had to choose any anyone, please don't put money on this. I just went with the highest odds, Houston. Like oh, That's Houston. who's up right now, so that's that's what I'm going with. Oh, uh, Houston, I've the been team. So dug in on football, and I like women's basketball, so I pay attention a lot to that, which nobody wants to talk about here, so we won't get there, but Houston was at the top of the odds. Hey, listen, don't say nobody. U UConn is hand-in-hand -hand with women's basketball. When UConn's I was there, that was is unbelievable. like people in Connecticut care to death about UConn women's basketball, and I respect it. After watching those women up close, they – very legit. And UConn is actually, oh. I think they're still number five in the country and missing their best overall player, Paige Beckers, who's just been out all season because she tore ACL right before the season started. So I'm looking forward to UConn pulling another actually double duty this season. Look, only program ever to win the men's and women's championship in the same season, and they've done it twice. Let's make it three. Let's run Let's it back. It three deep. Um, you want to know what's crazy is I grew up in Benita, Oklahoma. Don't try to find that on a map because you can't. it's so <laughs> small. It's Hicktown, Oklahoma. I was obsessed with UConn women's basketball solely because really? of how much of a powerhouse yep. they, they've just always had a really strong program. Yeah. yeah. I mean, while I was there, they won two national championships. They, it was, I got there like right in the middle of the four peat that they had with Brianna Stewart. So just absolute dominance from them. But now it's been several years since they've won it. So they're looking to try and get back there, but I believe South Carolina went undefeated this year. So that might be a tall task to try and topple them. But look, college basketball is reaching its apex right now. March madness mm -hmm. is about to be a blast. I cannot wait for the bracket reveal on Sunday. And then we will be diving very deep. Into I was going to say, you have a fun little contest coming up too. I you do. So we have a – it's a bench warmer brand, off the bench, heavy on sports, whatever, sponsored bracket pool that we will be – look, no limit to join and free to enter. And we'll be doing probably the top 10, I will say, uh, finishers will end up getting heavy gift cards. So we've got a bunch of T-shirts in – Got a bunch of T-shirts in the heavy store, some fun little puns and stuff about NFL players, and we're looking to possibly restock it with some new designs, maybe even one with our little show logo on there. Uh, so we'll TBD on that and exactly how all that's going to work. But the link is open. I've got it in 
my personal Instagram bio, our link tree, probably should try and get it into the off the bench link tree as well. But we're going to try and make it e as easy to access for you guys as possible. I want to see like thousands of people in this contest. Because look, even if you don't win one of the gift cards, you will win bragging rights if you can just beat myself or Maddie or whoever. Like we'll shout, we'll shout, not everybody, because God, if my bracket's awful, I can't read 700 <laughs> names on a podcast. But look, you'll get some props one way or one way or another. So get in there. Show up and show out. Yes, absolutely. So we'll be talking March Madness and plugging it again next week. But I, man, oh, March Madness, best time of year. It really is. I cannot wait to just sit and watch college basketball all goddamn day. All right. That is going to do it for this episode of Off the Bench. For Maddie Kroll, I'm Brandon Carney. We will see you guys next time.